In this hobby, people love to tell you what you can and cannot do and make up these rules. And one of these rules that I was told is you can't keep Caradina shrimp in a tank with CO2. They're just far too sensitive and they may live, but they'll never breed and they'll likely die. Well, for all the people who told me that, guess what? In this tank behind me here, I've been keeping Caradina shrimp alive for well over a year now. And not only that, in that span of the year, I've also been able to breed them multiple times and have multiple different generations of Caradina shrimp thriving in a tank where I'm injecting high amounts of CO2. And in today's video, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why it is difficult to keep Caradina shrimp in a tank with CO2 and why so many people have problems, as well as how I did it and how you can do it yourself. For those of you who are new to my channel, my name is Calum, and I'm currently working on my PhD in biochemistry, and when I'm not doing that, I'm working with my planet tanks. I've been keeping them for well over 10 years, and my goal on this channel here is to educate and teach you guys about the science behind your planet tank to help you reach your goals. So please consider subscribing and leaving a like. It helps get these videos out to more people, and lets me know you found the content helpful. There are two different genuses of shrimp we see in this hobby. The first one is Neocaridina. These are your red cherry shrimp, your blue dreams. They come in all different sorts of colors and all of them are pretty easy to care for, not that picky, and you should have no problem keeping them in a tank with CO2. That being said, this video will still provide a lot of tips and helpful information that'll help you grow a thriving colony of Neocaridina shrimp as well. The second genus is Caradina shrimp. These are your crystal reds and blacks, your blue bolts and your pintos, and there's many, many more different colorations of these as well. In my tank behind me, I have what we're calling peach bolts. These were a cross between blue bolts and I think some sort of red tiger. They're pretty weird looking and pretty unique, and I haven't seen others like them before. But Caradina shrimp have the reputation for being difficult and very sensitive. And I don't want this video to become like a care guide for for Caradina shrimp, but there is a couple things I wanted to touch on that will be important for the sake of keeping them with CO2. The reason Caradina shrimp get this reputation of being difficult to care for is because they require very soft water, typically between a pH of 6.5 and 5.5, which is difficult to achieve in the home aquarium. Most of our tap water is a lot higher. They like total dissolved solid levels between 100 and 200, and this is also known as TDS, and a GH or general hardness, which is your calcium and magnesium levels between three and six parts per million. Now, personally, my values for all of these are much higher and I'm not having any sort of problems. Personally, what I've found to be the most important is the KH or carbonate hardness. This is how much bicarbonates or carbonates you have in your water and is sometimes called buffering capacity. I keep mine between zero and one and have found this to lead to the most success with Caradina shrimp. When I had it even a little bit higher, I found I had much more difficulty keeping them alive and I definitely didn't see nearly as much breeding and have found keeping this between zero and one is the key to success for Caradina shrimp, at least in my case. This low KH is the main reason for all of the difficulties keeping Caradina shrimp and CO2 together. CO2 is an acid, so as you add it to your water, it will lower your pH. How fast or how slow this happens is based on your water's buffering capacity or carbonate hardness. So you have a very high KH. What happens is as you add CO2, the level of pH is going to gradually drop. If you have a very low KH, like zero or one, that the shrimp require, as you add CO2, there's not gonna be any buffering capacity, so the pH can drop drastically and very, very quick. So you have to be very careful to have your CO2 dialed in, and you don't wanna add nearly as much as you do to a tank with a high KH or carbonate hardness. A question that's frequently asked in the aquarium hobby, especially with people who are starting out with CO2, is how many bubbles per second of CO2 do you add? And this is a very hard question to answer because what works in my tank may not work in yours, and this is mainly due to the KH. If you have that low KH, I'm gonna add way less CO2 than someone with a high KH, and it's really a, a difficult question to answer that gets asked 
all the time. And this all depends on your pH, on how much CO2 you should be adding to your water. But anyways, back on topic. So with a low pH, you want to add less CO2. But you may have also noticed when I drew that little chart with my finger, you see a much steeper drop. This happens a lot quicker. So even a small change in the amount of CO2 you add can cause a drastic change. And if you add a bit too much one day or more CO2 than you usually do, this drastic change can cause your pH to crash and you can end up losing all your shrimp. So let's talk a little bit about how to avoid this and what causes these inconsistencies in your CO2. Because keeping your CO2 consistent is the key to keeping these caridina alive. Now I just said it myself, but keeping your CO2 consistent is probably one of my least favorite phrases in the hobby. I found it very confusing, especially starting out and a little bit misleading. I thought this was if you had, for example, a bad regulator that added funky amounts or messing with the amount of bubbles you added too much would cause problems. I know a lot of people relate it to different kinds of algaes where, oh, you're getting BBA because your CO2 isn't consistent and so on and so forth. But what do people actually mean by this? I would say an easier way to describe this is having a consistent amount of CO2 dissolving into your water. Don't touch your regulator, don't worry about that. There's a lot of different factors that will affect how much CO2 you're getting dissolved in that can change by day. The key to getting consistent amounts of CO2 to dissolve in your water is a strong flow rate and good gas exchange. Lots of surface agitation should help with that. But in most cases, this will change throughout the week. As the week goes on, your water level may lower, uh, leading to more flow and more surface agitation usually. This will lead to more CO2 escaping and lower levels of CO2 as the week goes on. Then you do your water change, fill the tank back up, and maybe you fill it a little bit higher than you usually do, this will cause uh, less surface agitation and more CO2 staying in the tank. So you can see where CO2 consistency can change really easily in a planted tank, but there's a couple easy solutions I'll talk about. Another factor that's important to consider, especially since you're keeping shrimp and you're likely wanting to grow a lot of biofilm, you may be adding something like Bacter AE, which grows biofilm in your tank that your shrimp will feed on, is um, surface film. If you have a buildup of surface film, it will trap CO2 in the water. And this is one of the fastest ways to kill a shrimp colony. If you get too much surface film building up, that CO2 isn't able to escape and it will definitely cause your pH to crash. So it's very important not to have any kind of surface film build up in your tank. Both of these issues that I've talked about are solved by a single piece of equipment that I could honestly make a whole video about. I absolutely love these things and have them on every single one of my tanks. And those are surface skimmers. There's a couple of different kinds I use. On this tank behind me here, the shrimp tank I've been showing, I use a Neo outlet, which basically is a little surface uh, skimmer attachment that hooks up onto my filter uh, pipes. These are the Neo filter pipes and they are a little bit more expensive, but it sucks the water off at the top, ensures I don't have any surface film build up and keeps things well oxygenated, as well as keeps the surface agitation relatively consistent throughout the week, no matter how high or how low the water level gets. On most of my other tanks, I use Eheim Skim 350s. These are one of my favorite products. I think I've got two of them. Uh, and these are great little surface skimmers. I love that you can remove them and clean them out super easily and they'll also collect any leaves. And then on one of my other tanks, I've got like an outflow or inflow surface skimmer, which works really good. The only problem is it will suck a bunch of stuff into your filter, which is a little bit harder to clean than the Eheim skim, which you can just take out on your own. But surface skimmers are definitely a must. Even if you're not keeping Caradina shrimp, I'd highly, highly recommend them for a planted tank with CO2. These are gonna be a game changer. These ensure you have very consistent levels of oxygenation, as well as no chance of this surface film building up, which can cause all those issues with your pH I talked about earlier. The next thing I wanted to talk about is filters. Typically, it's very common to recommend sponge filters, especially with shrimp. You don't have to worry about babies getting sucked up. But the problem is, especially if you're going to do CO2, I wouldn't trust how consistent the flow is. Those sponges get clogged up pretty quick 
and I think it would cause all sorts of problems. So while a low-tech tank, no CO2, definitely go for a sponge filter if you're gonna try to breed shrimp, but if you're doing it in a tank with CO2, I would recommend a canister or a hang on back. These are much more consistent in terms of flow rates, and even with a canister filter that's too big for this tank, I clean it at the very minimum every two months. I really try to keep this thing clean, keep the flow very consistent, because when it gets inconsistent, that's where you can run into problems with different levels of CO2 dissolving. Um, if you are going to do a canister or hang on back, I would recommend getting an inlet sponge to put over the end. In this case, I have a, a, another, another Neo product. This is like a Neo pipe that has very, very tiny holes that shrimp can't get into. And uh, I think it works great so far. I've seen pretty good uh, survivability with babies and it's not something like a sponge that will get clogged up really frequently. Another note is to keep your CO2 diffusers clean, especially if you're going to use an in-tank one. Keep it clean. Um, this will only lower the amount of CO2 you're adding, so it won't be as big of a problem as if it adds too much. In my tank, I use an inline diffuser. It stays out of the light a bit better, and I have to clean it a little less frequently, and the bubbles are more consistent, as well as the amount that I find dissolves in the water. Another thing that is important to touch on is the kind of CO2 regulator you're gonna choose. There's two kinds. There's ones with two gauges, and there's ones with a single gauge always go with a two gauge regulator. This will allow you to adjust the pressure that is coming out of your CO2 tank, tank. I've seen this happen with too many different people where they choose a single gauge regulator. What happens with those is you run into a problem called gassing off, where basically as the tank gets towards the end, it messes with the pressure a little because there isn't enough CO2, and instead of keeping it going at the same rate you were you know, previously going, it shoots out all the CO2 at once. And this can kill tanks, especially with something as sensitive as Caradina shrimp. It will kill them very, very easily. So you want to make sure you use a dual gauge regulator where you can set the pressure that the CO2 is leaving your canister at so you can avoid this issue. And the last thing I want to talk about are CO2 controllers. These are something you can look into if you're you know, nervous, if you have a very expensive line of shrimp and you want to be extra, extra careful, these are for you. CO2 controllers, you can plug your regulator in and set a range. So usually people aim to have their pH drop by one whole unit. So from, for example, 6.5 to 5.5 and they'll set their pH controller at 5.5. You have a pH meter in your tank that goes back to this machine and what happens is if the pH gets below 5.5, the pH controller will turn off your CO2. When it goes back above 5.5, it will turn your CO2 back on. This will prevent your pH from crashing and keep it around 5.5 while your lights are on so you don't run into any problems. And these are really good, uh, really consistent, uh, but the only problem with them is they're not cheap. They're, they're a little bit more expensive, but if you want that peace of mind, they're definitely a pretty cool piece of tool that you can use. But anyways guys, I hope you found this educational, learned something new, and enjoyed the video. If you guys have any questions, let me know down below. I make sure to get back to all of them. This was Calum's Fish Tanks. Thank you so much for watching. Peace.